waters of the great oceans, seas, lakes, rivers, and streams flowing through our mercy world connect us. And by the power of our baptism, unite us with Christ and our beloved foundress, Catherine McCauley. Today, we merge our membership directories into one united directory. Today, we merge our local waters with the waters of Dublin. We're in the womb in water, we're baptized with water. We blessed each other with the water that we mingled in, in Buffalo. Here you have places all over the world coming together and water is such an important part of um, those communities and their, their life. So to mingle all those waters was a very spiritual experience. Our story is like a great ocean of mercy from which each of us drew our first breath, giving life to the heart of God within, and then moving us forward as various streams and rivers, sanctifying, healing, transforming, and renewing, as each makes its winding way to a parched land. Thinking back now, I cannot help but be overwhelmed how inexhaustible is this great ocean that found its origin in the heart of such an unlikely Irish woman and continues to reach throughout the world. She was a Catholic woman in a very Protestant time. Catherine McCauley grew up in, uh, after her parents died and she was, uh, became a uh, helper uh, to the Callahan family. She was, lived much of her adult life in a Quaker household. And that was a household that didn't have Catholic symbols didn't have Catholic images, where she had to maintain her faith by, a, by her own strong prayer life. She was not, um, not in a ghetto which was predominantly Catholic. I think I, I responded to that part of her life. Catherine McCauley did not intend to found a religious order. She wanted to serve the people of Dublin, and with her inheritance, she built the House of Mercy. The House of Mercy opened in 1828. Catherine McCauley did not found the religious community, the Sisters of Mercy, until 1831. The reason she didn't want to found a religious order is because of the enclosure, because she felt that the activities of serving the poor would be restricted because of the enclosure. So the Sisters of Mercy really are the first religious order to be founded without the enclosure. The church asked the sisters and brothers all over the world to get acquainted with their founders. We got to know Catherine Macaulay much better. And in many ways, Catherine Macaulay's attention that she gives to the needs of people is something that makes her very much really loved today. She enjoyed being with older people, she enjoyed helping older people and supporting older people, and she shared her faith with them. She was quick to send Frances Ward to the United States. Frances Ward was, was young. She was a 
You know, she was a great friend of Catherine Macaulay's, but she saw the United States had this need. So Francis Ward ended up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I remember when I was um, a novice, I discovered she wrote a book um, just for novices, you know, with some of her sayings. And she certainly was a woman beyond her time. We recently found out uh, during the canonization process that, you know, she really is very much a woman who is a, that people in the contemporary world are attracted to. She loved to have fun. She played tricks on people. She made up little songs. Um, she was very playful. The comfortable cup of tea, or a, a cup of tea to keep them warm, that phrase sort of almost shows her extending herself to others and wanting us to do the same. I think it's not only offering a cup of tea, it's being present for people, taking care of their needs, caring about them, um, seeing what you can do to help. It's simmering and taking time to, taking time to really um, be steeped. To, and so I think it, it's about relationships and how we can be with one another as sisters in our community, how we um, value those relationships and support one another in sickness and celebration. She is saying this on her deathbed, thinking of the needs of other people. <laughs> it just fits, <laughs> you know. She would want her sisters to have some comfort and she would want them to come have comfort other people. You know, when you think thousands of women have followed her around the world, it's just so amazing. And for me, that thing about keeping our hearts centered in God is, you know, about action and contemplation and finding that balance. It's about ministry and, and being on the move and, and responding to God's call. It's about, um, you know, being where you are and dancing with who you're who you're with and then moving with the rhythm of life where life takes you. I come from an Irish New England Roman Catholic family. My father always stressed that. In South Buffalo you have this mercy community. You have St. John Evangelist School. We all went to St. John's. Say, I had the good fortune of growing up in a, in a family that believed in Christ. My father was a Catholic and my mother was a Methodist, now United Methodist. I certainly wasn't encouraged at home. And not because my parents, you know, had anything against religious. They just thought they wanted grandchildren. <laughs> Um, our family was a very Catholic family. We would always um, sit in the like, second row, second pew. Each of us comes from different backgrounds, with different experiences, drawn from different streams. But as we reflected back on our roots, each of us found the common and distinctive presence of the one God who first breathed life into our hearts, who continues to fill us more completely with a desire to know, love, and serve Him with our lives. My sister and I weren't very good at going to our CCD classes. Uh, they were, we, we were instructed by the Baltimore Catechism, and it was mostly rote memory. Uh, you know, you, you memorized uh, the questions and the answers, and after a while, that got uh, kind of boring. But my mother, uh, I remember there was a Bible salesman came along, and she, she, she uh, bought this you know, beautiful, big, uh, ornate family Bible. But she also uh, got this series of magazines that were called Crusade, and they were Bible stories for children. 
There were stories about uh, Abraham and Isaac, about uh, Joseph and the coat of many colors. There was the story of David and David's dancing before the ark. And I remember loving those stories that fired my imagination. And I wanted to be like, you know, like David or be like these people. But I remember one particular time thinking about their, their sacrifice of animals and thinking, I could never make a sacrifice like that, you know. There was Smokey, our little dog, you know, and I thought, this, I don't know how anybody could ever do anything like that. I'd help my dad put baskets together for people who were needy. But when you're in third grade, you don't really get the, the point. And we did about 40, 50 baskets every single holiday and then he'd put fruit in them in the summer. So here growing up, my dad is doing all this service. So he had this mercy spirit when I was, I recognized it I think in second grade when I was making my first communion. When I made my first communion, I was the oldest in the family, kind of a new experience, you know, to be dressed up in a pretty white dress and to have a, you know, a store-bought cake and I just got very overwhelmed and got sick and threw up, right? <laughs> we were in line to make our, you know, to proceed in, and one of the sisters, who was then Sister Emmanuel, um, took me aside and dried me off and kind of calmed me down, and, and just her kindness, the way that she looked at me, her um, compassion, gentleness, just her presence um, was something that I always remembered. When I was 14 years old, I uh, had to go in the hospital and have my tonsils out. And I remember lying in bed probably late in the evening, maybe, maybe nine o'clock, and Sister Denise Carroll came in. And Sister Denise was a Sister of Mercy from Erie, but actually her home was Ireland, and she still had her Irish brogue. And she told me this story uh, about this boy that she knew he uh, was getting ready for his confirmation, and he had a, uh, a bone, a chicken bone or a fish bone of some sort, got lodged in his throat, and he started to choke. And his grandmother, who must have been a very strong believer, took this, this uh, Benedict medal, St. Benedict medal, put it in a uh, glass of water and told him to drink of it. Now the glass of water he drank, I think the metal stayed in the bottom of the glass, uh, and the bone went out. Well, she took this Benedict medal, and she had a Heinz pickle pin, and she fastened it onto my gown. I think she planted some of the earliest seeds of my religious vocation and the seeds of my wanting to come to the Sisters of Mercy. I saw the sisters. They were good mentors. They were dedicated to their um, students. You hear all these old wives' tales about sisters. Uh, and what they were like in school. I didn't see any of that. I didn't see the harshness or any of that that lots of people like to talk about in their, you know, happened in their childhood. You know, we, you hear of people hating high school. I couldn't wait to get there. And at that time, you had a lot of young sisters at the college, um, and they looked happy. As you see them coming down the hall, they, they would smile. And again, like I said before, they had time for you. There was a whole aura of mystery about them. Even at St. Luke's when I, you know, when I first came to Mercyhurst, you know, they were, they were all sort of enclosed in these habits, you know, their, the veils, their veil boards were kind of keeping their, keeping their faces somewhat hidden. There was something different about the way that they respected people, the way that they were interested in you in a very, in a very um, deep way compared to other people that, you know, it was just a job. You know how it becomes part of you. You know, it just, it got into my blood. They were happy. You know, they, they enjoyed one another. And there was hardly anyone you couldn't go and say, gee, I have this problem, can I talk to you about it? And I fell in love with the sisters. I mean, we had marvelous women teaching us. The sisters were so good to my mother. Uh, I'm sure that that, you know, stayed with me. They really taught us how to pray. Now, it wasn't that, it wasn't the, um, the centering prayer, it was more words, you know, to pray with words. But that brought me to God, to, to be conscious that God is, is present and part of every second of every day.
often I was going to daily mass. I would drive in from Grampian to Dubois, and so one day I got my courage up, and as the sisters, you know, filed out of mass, you know, really a long single file, I went to the back and I went over to this one uh, young sister who was at the end of the, really at the end of the line, and I asked her if I could talk to her about the cadet teacher program. Well, that happened to be Sister Domenica, and that was the beginning of a friendship that's lasted all our religious life. Uh, she was very gracious uh, and very warm. When I d decided that I wanted to be a Sister of Mercy, I was uh, at the end of my freshman year, maybe the beginning of my sophomore year at Mercyhurst, and I made it was often went to the chapel to pray, and I was in the chapel at Mercyhurst at the Christ the King uh, Chapel. And I was kneeling, I can still remember kneeling um, and looking at the statue actually of the Blessed Virgin. And I remember thinking, I, I suppose as many people did at that time, I, I was thinking about really what I was doing with my life and where I was going. I loved to study, I liked my classes at Mercyhurst. And there was a lot of campus unrest. There was a good deal of activism on campus. The era of the Kent State uh, crises, uh, Vietnam, I remember having a very clear sense that uh, I wanted to know Christ and I wanted to help other people know Christ. That's sort of remained for me a kind of a, uh, uh, a grounding uh, for my life. I guess as I look back on my entering religious life in that era, I think that for me, entering religious life in the late 60s was my countercultural movement. I had a chance to be a cadet, cadet teacher at Mercyhurst College. My mother thought that would be a better environment for me. It was a liberal arts college and I'd get a better education. I think she lived to regret that decision because after two or three years I decided to enter the convent. By that time my father had died. He died in my freshman year. It was clear that I wasn't uh, wasn't of age and couldn't make that decision or couldn't enter at that time. So I waited until I was 21 and it was a good decision. I never regret that. It was not easy to do to sort of turn my back on what my mother, what my mother's wishes were and she was kind and loving and gentle. She of course wanted what all mothers did. She wanted me to grow up and get married and have grandchildren. I think I, you know, I just simply took it step by step. At one point she said, well, if you're going to go, go now. So I went back to college and waited until my entrance date, which was um, in January. But I went back to see her, and it was difficult to drive away from the house knowing, you know, knowing that my, and my mother said, I'll never come to see you, though she did. Mercy's at that time, we had to be at mass for different things, and we had many activities we went to. But I'd started going to daily mass in high school and I just continued it in college. Um, and there was something about that chapel I think attracted a lot of us. I think I shocked people when I entered. They said Mother Borgia almost took to her bed when she heard I was entering. <laughs> My father had died when I was a sophomore in high school. And when I went down to tell my mother I was going to enter, she wasn't too happy. And it wasn't until later I found out that she had made a deathbed promise to my dad that I would get my college degree. So when the good nuns told her I would graduate with my class, I entered in December. From Christmas on, if you were a senior and you were entering, you had meetings with the younger classes, talking about your vocation. And I remember sitting there as a sophomore. Now, I, I was attracted to the sisters anyway and then the fact that my sister was in the community. But when these girls who were entering would meet with us, I thought, oh, you know, what a thing to do with your life. I, I was just so attracted to it, you know. And I did date. I had a wonderful friend, boyfriend, but, but friend, you know, not just boyfriend, just a really good friend. We entered with 32, and then by the time we were finally professed, we were 24. I told my mother on my confirmation day that I wanted to be a sister. So I would imagine I was 12, because I think they were doing it in the, probably the eighth grade at that point in time. 
And it, the thought never left my mind. I kept coming back to it. The problem that I had was that I wanted to teach. <clears throat> I felt my career goals were teaching and I didn't know a teaching community. So when I was a senior in high school, we had a Catholic guidance counselor who said that since we did not have an opportunity to go to Catholic schools, he wanted us to see a Catholic college. I knew the minute I drove through the gates that I was going to Mercyhurst. And you have to imagine that we were a very poor country family. But my heart was set on Mercyhurst. And I only applied to Mercyhurst. I didn't apply to any other school. When I was accepted, I received the highest award that, that Mercyhurst, I think, has ever given. They certainly wouldn't do it today. It was a full tuition and full room and board scholarship. And you can imagine that I was not a saint at college. If there was trouble, I was in it. We played every prank that ever existed. But we loved the nuns. The, the sisters at the college at that period in time were young. And see, for me, that was a whole new revelation, and they taught. And those were the, that was the magic combination. By Christmas, I knew I wanted to enter um, that community, Sisters of Mercy, and I talked to Sister Mary Pius. <laughs> talk about support. <laughs> ah, my father didn't talk to me from Christmas until the first visiting Sunday. So I entered in Titusville after my soft, at, at the beginning of my sophomore year, what had been. I entered on a Friday in September. It was a first Friday. Uh, Monday was Labor Day, and Tuesday I was teaching third grade. <laughs> I wanted to teach. The small problem though, I had never been inside a Catholic school. <laughs> I didn't know the routine. I didn't know anything about it, but we got through all that. It was a pretty gradual thing, you know, kind of like that hound of heaven, um, you know, the ideas that just um, keep coming back. I remember being in high school and sitting in history class and being distracted with thoughts like, oh, maybe you ought to be a sister, you know, wouldn't that be a great, you know, life and just feeling drawn to that kind of life and then trying to turn it off the best that I could, you know, and not to think about it and after I graduated from college, I uh, was a Mercy volunteer. Uh, I gave a year of full-time service with the Sisters of Mercy, and I was on the Acoma and Laguna Reservation. It was about community, it was about spirituality, it was about living simply, and those things brought a lot of joy to me, even though it was a real challenge, because during my year I was a very particular eater, and I lived with vegetarians, and I was also a big television watcher. So, um, you know, we watched television maybe 10 times that whole year. So I changed so dramatically and seeing those changes and how life-giving it was for me was a real confirmation. So I entered the Sisters of Mercy after my Mercy Volunteer Corps experience and you know I just find that that's a, a wonderful way for young people to be introduced to the um, to the charism of mercy. I think your first files made a, an impression but you knew this was final. Um, you knew you were committing yourself, and there was something about that ring going on your finger uh, and the motto in your ring. To, to make that final decision that this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life, yeah. It took, I mean, I, I was so glad I, I had the opportunity to make a 30-day retreat. And I think by that time you knew this is where you wanted to be, and you knew you wanted to give your life this way. Final profession for me, at, at the end of that ceremony, or during that ceremony, I felt a, a strength and a reassurance that indeed God was faithful to me, and He would continue to be so. And He was the one who was going to keep me, at least in the struggle. And as I matured, I realized it's the struggle that makes us who we are and what we are. The fi finality or the um, perpetuality of the commitment was um, a bit frightening for me at first and took me a long time to kind of grow into. Um, and I guess now I'm happier than I ever thought I would be.
Sometimes the rivers moved us with a sense of tranquility, familiarity, and ease. But at other times, with the force of a mighty rapids, or even a mighty wind, the breath of heaven drawing us in, forming us, and leading us places we never could have anticipated. It's in those moments I recall the words of our beloved foundress, Catherine McCauley. We should be as the compass that goes round its circle without stirring from its center. Our center is God, from whom all our actions should spring as from their source. church knew we were headed to Vatican II and, and change was beginning to come. When I was a canonical novice, we took classes uh, and I still remember Sister Maria in one of those classes talking about John, uh, John the 23rd opening the windows to the world. I still remember that phrase. And your whole life was much different than today because you came home from school, you had recreation, you had study, you seldom went out at night. Sister Bertha, who was our mistress, uh, was going to formation meetings, so she would come back and we were the guinea pigs of what she learned at these formation meetings. The sisters apparently were, they were excited about reading certain books, they were talking about books. Uh, it really was, you know, there was sort of, really was like a sort of a breath of fresh air. But when you're in the midst of change, things tighten up. It's almost a, a reaction, or it is a reaction, Maybe to hang on to what you're secure with, with what you know. We were the period where we had nine o'clock silence uh, from nine o'clock until the next morning. We had silence for meals. Your whole life was a very calm, peaceful life, really. And as you look back, you begin to think, hey, those were good days. <laughs> it was a time of turmoil within the community. before everybody was at daily mass, everybody was at prayers. Then you start going to meetings at night, or you had meetings, breakfast meetings, um, so you couldn't be there. And that affected a lot of people. You had those who wanted to hang on to what they knew. You had those who were anxious for change, and it wasn't always comfortable. And most people, like myself, I never liked that modified habit. I think when you entered, you thought you would be in that habit for life. And I loved our habit. I, I, I loved it. It was hard on people. Once people realized that we were still religious, I think we had to work harder to prove that. But I think we did. The church called us to go back to the spirit of our, the char our charism, to the spirit of our foundress. There, there were not the constraints in the early years of the Sisters of Mercy, but because cloister and monasticism was what the church knew, after Catherine Macaulay's death, monasticism really crept in. By the time I entered in 1964, religious life, all religious life was more homogeneous, I guess I'd say. We were more monastic in many ways. We had the enclosure. We had um, rules and regulations about when we needed, when we could be out. And yet, in some cases, ministry might require you to be out. So when we went back to the spirit of the foundress, it took us a long time, I think, to come to an understanding of what that spirit is, how you develop the balance of the rhythm of prayer and work. And, and the, the struggle was because most of the sisters, particularly as they matured, and many of them were older, um, certainly older than I was, they had lived their whole lifetime in religious community in a more monastic structure. And all of a sudden things are changing. All of a sudden we're saying the habit is not necessary for our ministry. 
Catherine Macaulay, they did wear the habit some of the time, but because of the persecution in Ireland, they didn't wear it a great deal of the time. So, you know, so there were adaptations for the needs of the people of the times. Father Henry Birkenhauer was a wonderful man. He was a Jesuit. He said, if Vatican II hadn't happened, the church would have been, many people felt like the church was, you know, worse off for Vatican II, but he felt it would have been in much worse shape. He saw this as a, really, Vatican II as a wonderful gift to the church. I think we think of religious life as, as giving up as being solemn and serious and, uh, and not enjoyable. Every person is working towards their relationship with God. Every person is working towards reunion with God in the best way that they can. And after these many years in religious life, I found out that indeed there is more to religious life, and that is, you know, a life of friendship with God, a life given to the love of people. By being a Sister of Mercy, um, I have chosen a way of life that leaves me freer to be able to do that, unencumbered by other responsibilities. You know, all the crises that have, ha that have plagued the church now, um, I think can affect people in terms of their faith um, and in terms of their participation and what they see as valuable. These times in the church are a blessing for us to be able to recognize the, the humanness that is part of the church, that is part of us individually, that is part of the world. There are sisters who share my life, my experiences, my hopes, my visions. It's simplicity, it's uh, spirituality, it's um, commitment, community. Community was real big. And, and I think a lot of young people today, when they're thinking of religious life, are searching for community. I have sisters, in a very real sense now, that I don't have naturally. And we are a family. They see us in our work environment, but they don't realize that we play together, we work together, um, we pray together. Before we leave for Mass, we pray morning prayer together. You know, it's either in the morning or early in the evening after supper. The sisters kind of go apart uh, for some private prayer. Uh, some do centering prayer, some say the rosary. After supper, we have evening prayer together. Our prayer life of personal prayer and community prayer, I think, is what uh, is really the, 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 the glue that holds us together. I see Jesus um, sacramentally and his real presence in the Eucharist and in and the people that we serve. For the Sisters of Mercy, Eucharist is always a central, central part of our day. Sacrifice in or outside of liturgy is a, a giving of oneself, an offering, a denial if you want. As a community, there are a number of things that fit with that. First of all, you don't always get your own way, that's for sure. There's a constant give and take. There's also an intimacy in commun community. Students and, and even adults say, well, you know, how can you go to Mass every day? It's the same old, same old. Well, it's not the same old, same old. And the description that I give is, is an M. And so that at the first part of the liturgy, you talk to God, and there's a different you that presents yourself each day. You've had different experiences, different frustrations. You're a different person each day. So the you that you present to the community or to the Eucharist is a very different person. Then as far as liturgy, you have the readings. So you talk to God, first of all, then he talks to you. And even though you've heard the story, you hear it differently. Then you present yourself to God and it's a different gift. And certainly community um, polishes that gift. It takes off all the rough edges. 
uh, community um, is happy to tell you what they <laughs> would like to change about you. Often people see in us much more than we see in ourselves and they challenge us and they support us. Sometimes they're, they're okay to support you and to tell you nice things. We get to know one another, you know, we really know one another in some ways too well. But more often than not, they're like every happy family, they want to change you and they're more than happy to smooth away those rough edges. They help to nurture uh, us in so many ways. It's one of the great gifts of community life. And that's good. That's a polishing experience that we need to get. And then there's the communion, uh, that you, you really receive God with different gifts each day. I remember when I was uh, in this department store folding socks, uh, thinking there's got to be more to life. Many people would say I was very successful. You know, I'm a PhD, you know, I've been an administrator at sort of high level. Now, many years later, I realize that I could be happy folding socks because it's the love with which you do something that makes all the difference. Peaches is a lovebird. He's the smallest of the parrot family. Uh, very, very intelligent. He knows before I do when a storm comes because of his body language. He loves people. That's one of his God, the God things that he is for me. He just loves people. That's why he, I don't have him up in my room during the day. He's on the infirmary. He has breakfast with people, he has lunch with people, and he has dinner with people because he's social, they're social, birds are social, but they fall in love with you. So it's, it's, the, it's the idea of love, God's love. Whatever you think a nun is, don't expect me to be that. I'm really, I do listen to a different drummer. I am cut from a different cloth. And I think for somebody who may be listening to this, who is considering a vocation, I could be, I could be good news. <laughs> You're not going to be put into a mold. In a community, uh, the sisters see gifts in you and they help those gifts to unfold and blossom. Religious life does allow you, um, at least religious life as I know it, allows you to develop and to create your best self. back and ask how I felt with my final vows. Um, so many communities only take three vows, but I think when you make that fourth vow, you are really saying something. Service to the poor, sick, and uneducated. No one is ever touched by Christ unless they're first touched by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. Mercy, uh, I think, impels the heart to action. It's really our relationship with God that centers the service in a way that um, makes it possible to reach out even further. Catherine McCauley attracted women who were able to respond to the particular needs of the moment. To me, the most important thing is our witness, our example, our presence. Hearing the sisters talk, they know every single you know, student they ever had and it's, they know all the families of every student they ever had. They go to all the funerals of all the families. I love it when people come and stay. Hospitality is exciting for me. Uh, I would like to, to meet people. I would like to, um, to show them around. I'm very proud of our campus and our mother house surrounding. So if they haven't seen the grounds or they haven't been around the building, I take the time to show them that. Baggett Street was formed by Catherine McCauley in, in 1831. And so um, the Erie community was the first in the whole institute, the smallest in the whole institute, and yet the first to be able to respond by opening a new house of mercy. And not only did we just choose a house, we built the house. <laughs>
You know, we really looked at the needs in Erie and we said, okay, where are the unmet needs? We moved to the east side because that's where the, you know, the needs were unmet after talking with local officials and looking at agencies that were providing services. The first week we were there, I walked around the neighborhood because, you know, Catherine McCauley was a walking sister. How else are you going to get to know people? I walked around and invited them to come see the new house. And we had like about 13 people, 13 young kids, most of whom were immigrants. We still have the list on our refrigerator of their, their first names and the countries they were from. And just to really feel part of the spirit of, of the founding sisters and founding that new ministry. Since I entered the community, you know, uh, Mercy Center of Aging was, was founded, Mercy Terrace Apartments was founded. Uh, Mercy Center for Women, which began as a little, uh, just a little house. I remember, I remember when Sister Carolyn, who was the president of the community at the time, spoke about the need of some kind of transitional living for women. Sister Gabriel Cook was an extraordinary woman. She had a PhD in French. She was an extraordinary businesswoman. She built this center with a vision and an insight that is, the center is 34 years old. Um, she had a health clinic in a senior center when that was unheard of. She had a, a licensed beauty shop in a senior center when today that's still cutting edge. Sister Gabriel, who was, you know, tremendous in the community, they say when she left Mercyhurst College, she was, they had to replace her with a finance officer, a treasurer, and a uh, uh, plant manager. <laughs> Three people. When you participate in working with those who are economically poor and disadvantaged, we gain more out of it than we, than we actually give. We're going to get the graces. We're going to find the face of God in the people we serve. Like working with the women at prison, I mean, their faith and their um, gratitude for our presence you know, with them is more than we can offer them. When you work with the elderly, you just have to, they, well they teach you patience because it might take them a half hour to get to the dining room. I remember one young woman, I had her in class, several classes, and she was, she always wore black. She came into my office once and we were talking, you know, found out that she grew up in an alcoholic family. And she looked up at me and she said, how do you learn to forgive? So we talked a while and then later on, I was correcting her, this is at the end of the term, I was correcting her exam. This young woman traced through all those stories a theme, and in her final exam, mind, it just kind of threaded through uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. When we have a relationship with Christ, what happens is we can really become real people. Uh, we had a sister die yesterday, Sister Aloysia and they allowed me to prepare her body. That is the most sacred thing, the most sacred part of my ministry is to work with someone who has died. The, the respect, the care, the love, the compassion to do that. It gives me a, a, a total look at, at eternity and life and then you never know when you're gonna die, the shortness of life. There was a woman, a, a woman who was not your typical street person. She wasn't street tough, but she was hungry, and she hadn't eaten in a long time. And she ate and ate and ate, and then of course was sick, because the liver was too rich for her. And I, and I felt very responsible for her discomfort because I thought, I should have known that. But, you know, and then she cried and cried and cried. And as I held her, I thought she came from a different environment. She wasn't a street person. There but for the grace of God go any one of us. We're all, or can all be, one bad decision away from homelessness. At that moment, 
you realize where God is in your life. They are really the face of God for us. But what it tells me is I need to be the face of God for them. We had a practice of serving tea to the people um, who came to the back door. Again, the homeless in, in Dublin. The police, the Garda, as they call them in Ireland, were trying to convince us that we should stop that practice because it, um, it was becoming dangerous. You know, as I reflected on that later, I went back to a moment with Catherine McCauley. When they were dedicating the chapel in 1828, the bishop was there and they were all ready to go, and they were looking for Catherine McCauley, and she wasn't there. And when they finally found her, she said, tell them to go ahead, I'm with Christ at the door. She was talking to a widow and, who's, um, who was hungry and had five children to feed. So I, since then, have used that to say to myself, where is Christ at the door for me? It's great women, you might say, in great moments. <laughs> I think that Christ at the door motto of Catherine Macaulay's is, is really the heart of our mission. The waters of the great oceans, seas, lakes, rivers, and streams flowing through our mercy world connect us. Martyr means witness. We're searching for role models, people who can witness to us of a life well-lived, an authentic life, a real life. I think that would be the greatest gift that could be given to the world today. And I think their religious women have a unique role to play. I think it's a witness to the church. And to me, it's a positive thing that we aren't just sitting back, that we are moving forward. And I think by coming together, we're going to make a bigger impact. The Regional Community of Erie, founded in 1870, come placing all your confidence in God. I believe in Jesus Christ because he has been the mainstay in my life. The, the listening and the tenderness of God, you know, so much of, for me, so much of living my religious life has been living life as the day comes. He has been the mast, he has been my anchor, he has been my love, he has been my life. As of January 1, 2008, we will be known as the New York, Pennsylvania, Pacific West community. The other communities in this venture include Buffalo, Rochester, Pittsburgh, and the Philippines. Um, and as I look back, I see God in every, every moment of my life in every every job that I had, every ministry that I had. So now that's the heart of religious life is friendship with Christ sort of extends us into the whole body of Christ, you know, into the whole church, into the whole world community. You know, the timelessness of the of of mercy was was just so evident. When you think of all the sisters and all of the ministries and the work that have gone before, it just to be part of that is to be part of a timeless legacy. And by the power of our baptism, unite us with Christ and our beloved foundress, Catherine McCauley. Today we merge our local waters with the waters of Dublin. Today we merge our membership directories into one united directory. Love is a language that doesn't need a lot of words. <laughs>
Hope really is a theological virtue. <laughs> it really is something of God. In the end, I've come to realize there really is no end, just another beginning, another stream, another river flowing forward from the one infinite source, the great ocean of God's mercy, capturing us and drawing us back to Him. Because of this, I cannot help but be moved by the expression of praise and surrender by our Foundress, Catherine McCollum. My God, I am yours for time and eternity. Teach me to cast myself entirely into the arms of your loving providence with a lively, unlimited confidence in your compassionate, tender pity. Grant, O most merciful Redeemer, that whatever you ordain or permit may be acceptable to me. Take from my heart all painful anxiety. Let nothing sadden me but sin. Nothing delight me but the hope of coming to the possession of you, my God and my all, in your everlasting kingdom. Amen. For all the young women that are out there that are searching for where God is leading you, I would encourage you to stay with the search and I would invite you to come and see the Sisters of Mercy. You know, come and see who we are. Come and see our ministries. Come and see how we treat one another. And I would just love to have you come and see the House of Mercy, the ministries that we have that are at the edge. I believe in Jesus Christ because um, I've met him. He's very real to me. I think that with religious life, that if this is something from God, and I believe that religious life is something from God, uh, that it will continue. Uh, and so uh, I have uh, hope in the future of religious life because I have hope in God. As Mary sang her hymn of praise, she realized that what we give up in this life, Jesus will raise us up in eternal life and give us more happiness and more riches than we could ever experience on earth. It's been a great ride, and I expect it to continue to be. It's a great life. 